God's grace and God's peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who humbled himself for us, that we might humble ourselves before him and others. Dear Christian friends, today I'm going to talk to you as we continue uh, going through the book of James, James chapter 4, how Christian love battles pride with humility. I start out with a simple story. It goes like this. There was a woman leaving the worship service. The worship had concluded. She walked out and she said to the pastor, Pastor, I enjoyed your sermon. The pastor said, Don't thank me. Thank the Lord. The woman replied, Pastor, it wasn't that good. As we go through the book of James, there's been talk of humility. Uh, I could go, you know, right from the very beginning, uh, James calls himself a slave, literally, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, a description of humility. He talks about we'll have trials in our life. He talks about um, temptations that come our way. And in the midst of it, he says we're to do this in chapter 1, verse 21. He said, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. That word has the power to save your soul. There early on, it talked humility. Another spot that it spoke was we had rich and poor, and God said, it's the poor that I exalt, the humble. Pastor Roselle spoke beautifully about um, wisdom and what kind of wisdom we have. Is it the wisdom from above, or is it earthly wisdom? And in uh, chapter 3, it says these words, verse 13. Live an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. And what's the results of it? Well, a lot of good fruit, the good fruit of peace. There'll be order, and there'll be beauty, there'll be love in the fellowship. Well, that won't be present without humility. So what is humility itself? It's the willingness to utilize who you are and what you have been given by God for the good of others before yourself to the glory of God. That's the key, others before yourself. Within that really is included other people for sure, but it's also humility before God. The opposite of humility, pride and selfishness can be envy, wanting what others have. There's a few things to say at the beginning about humility. First, humility presupposes personal dignity and worth. It presupposes it, meaning you have it. God created you in his image. Jesus died for you. For those who believe, he's placed his spirit within us. We have dignity and worth. Secondly, humility is a willing choice. It's not somebody else forcing you to be humble. Jesus had the disposal of heaven to him, and yet he made a choice to come to us. Now, we know our choice comes from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to pattern our lives after Jesus. It doesn't save us. It just gives the world a beautiful picture of who this Jesus and who this God is. Lastly, humility is primarily expressed socially, not privately. Again, it's in relationship to people that true humility is seen. It's not standing with yourself looking in a mirror. Well, there's a gentleman of our time. He's a singer married to uh, Kim Kardashian, of all people. And he said, I still think I am the greatest. Is that a humble statement? I don't think so. In contrast to Kanye West is the example of Jesus who washed his disciples' dirty feet. It was shocking in its day. It would remain so 
in our day if people had dirty feet. No one would want to do it, but Jesus would do it. And he did even more to show his humility. He cared for the lepers. He heard cries and pleas for, Lord, have mercy upon me. And he healed people. And ultimately, he took their sicknesses and sins upon himself in humility and died in the most shameful way you can imagine on a cross. And yet God raised him from the dead and exalted him, and that's the pattern for us. So we're to learn of Jesus. He's the perfect example. He himself invites us. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. I want you to join with me in reading Philippians 2. If you need to pull out your glasses, that's okay. Uh, Sometimes Pastor Warren puts too much here. But for those who can read it, Philippians 2, let's read it together. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And that's the challenge as we learn humility in our lives. Well, how do we do that? How do we live humbly before God and others? Well, true humility begins not with boasting, but with confession of sin. Boasting can be a couple kind of boasting. It does speak of boasting in Scripture. The negative way, we boast in ourselves. I don't need God. I have all I need. Secondly, it can be boasting in the Lord. But I would submit to you that humility doesn't start with boasting in the Lord even. It submits with confessing before Him our sin. And so it starts out with the problem. What's causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at work within you? And it goes on to explain that. What are we to do? We're to kneel at the foot of the cross before Jesus and admit our desperate need of him and that we've caused some of the problems. Again, what are the problems? Wars and fights. That's what it says uh, literally, polemics. Uh, it, it's a verbal fight defending um, your, your stance in opposition to someone else can result in fights. Notice these two people, though it's a cartoon character, they have these little uh, symbols around them because they're saying things mean and things that shouldn't be printed against one another. And they have clenched fists ready to bop one another. So often like us that we have to deal with problems in the world and who's at fault? Who's the problem? Earlier in James it said, God doesn't tempt anyone to evil, but we say, okay, it's not God, it's y'all. Not me, the problem is you, right? But we go to the Bible where it says differently. We heard it read. We have the great theologian Pogo who said, We've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Just look in the mirror. The source of the problem is not beyond us. The source is within us. C.S. Lewis put it very beautifully and bluntly in one of his writings. He said, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the very first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. It's a biggish step, too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you're not conceited, it means you're very conceited indeed. And so we are. It's one of the sins that's hard to confess. It's built in when we confess our sins. But one of the big sins caused by sin within us is how often do we pray, Lord, forgive me for my pride. No, 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 Lord, it's their problem. No, it's our problem. The problem is here. The sin that dwells within us, the Bible calls it the flesh. This desire for pleasures that 
we feel like we have to get on our own. Everybody else has it, so we deserve it too. Instead of submitting ourselves to God, cause of our problems, no, it's our flesh. Secondly, it's the world. You'll see that in verse 4. A little bit later, it says, uh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, verse 7. The, world, the word there for evil desires is hedonism. Uh, you maybe haven't used that since your philosophy or ethics days. It's pursuing pleasure as the goal in life. You always have to ask, pleasure for whom? Is it pleasure for self? Is it pleasure for y'all? Is it pleasure for God? So often we seek the lights. Pleasure Island is there, and it calls, and it screams out to us as the woman does in Proverbs. Come to me, I'll give you all you want. Things like success and money and fame and fortune and wealth and power, sexual indulgence and drugs and greed and jealousy, it's all yours. Just bow at my feet as Jesus was asked to do before the devil in Matthew 4 and in Luke. Our great need is to be taken out of our cramping preoccupation with ourselves, delivered from the prison of our egocentricity. Ego is I, I-centric. How do we live humbly before God and others? First, by confessing, Lord, I'm a proud man. God, be merciful to me, a sinful person. Secondly, true humility doesn't come from skipping or omitting prayer, but comes from making prayer or uh, supplication to God. Supplication is just a bigger word for uh, prayer itself or asking God, making requests. See, at first, it's wars and fightings among us. And what's the deeper root? The deeper root is a messed up relationship with God. So what do we do? We pray, God, change my desires. Delight yourself in the Lord, it says in, in Psalm 37, and he will give you the desires of your heart. First, you delight yourself in him. You do as this little boy. You pray and you ask God, why don't we have what we want? It tells us. Sometimes we don't ask God. Sometimes we ask him with wrong motives. There was a man years ago who was mega rich. He was a famous multimillionaire. He was attending a dinner. He heard a discussion on the topic of prayer. He listened for a while, and then he sm spoke up with a sneer almost on his face. He said, prayer may be all right for some of you, but frankly, I don't need it. Everything I have today, I work for. I earned it all myself. I didn't ask God for a thing. The university president, who was sitting next to him, said to the boastful person, Sir, there's one thing you don't have that maybe you ought to pray for. Startled, the millionaire blurted out, And what might that be? The person said back, Sir, you could pray for just a little bit of humility. He boasted as if he did it all himself. He needed humility. Humility is something we should constantly pray for and never thank God for the fact that we have it. The moment you said, thank you, God, for making me humble, well, but I'm thankful I'm not like that other person over there. You've just blown it. We ask God, sometimes we do it with wrong motives. We have the grid of the Lord's prayer to guide us. Is it wrong to maybe ask for a car or a new home or just special things? Maybe not, but you put it through the test of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, Father, I'm praying for this new car that your name might be honored, that your kingdom might come, that your will be done. Lord, if I'd ever have a chance to have this new car, 
I will use it to honor you, to help others, to make sure people get to church. But so often we pray, Lord, give me this because I need it and I want it and it's for me, I deserve it. And God says, not. Thirdly, how do we live humbly before God and others? True humility doesn't come from friendship with the world. It comes from submission to God. We bow the knee somewhere. Where do we do it? And this is part of the, well, problem again, but also the solution. When we think in terms of friendship, we think of a casual acquaintance. I'm friends with so-and-so. Doesn't mean you necessarily share their priorities and values, but in a biblical day, when you shook hands, you were keeping true to your promise. You would go on the line for your friend. It was a deep commitment. Friendship with the world. And yet God says, what does it mean to be a friend of the world? It means to be proud. That's the way the world is. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble, the scriptures say. And then one of the biggest lambastings in the Bible is there in chapter 4. It begins with verse 4 right at the beginning. Now, if you're not careful, you might just gloss over it. But this is the words of the prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah would point their finger and say, you adulteresses. And you say, I didn't sleep with somebody that wasn't my spouse. And they were referring to relationship with God, that God is our husband. We are his bride. We slept with the world. And God wanted us to be right there with him, to know him intimately. So how often have we prayed, God, forgive me, I'm an adulteress, an adulterer. I need your forgiveness. And the wonder of wonders is he doesn't lead us there. He makes us his faithful bride. I don't like how I did these columns. I didn't know how to do them, quite frankly. On the one side, you have James saying, this is who you are. This is what you've done. You're an adulteress. On the flip side, what we ought to be, a faithful bride of Christ. And I say what you ought to be, and yet the Bible declares us to be that person, that entity. We are the faithful bride of Christ. We are. How so? Read Ephesians 5. Christ loved us and gave himself for us, cleansing us by the washing with water through the word so we could come as his bride in white clothing. We're cleansed. We can have a new start. If you've messed up your relationship with God, you can be made new. You can be forgiven. Instead of being friends with the world or his enemies, God wants to be friends with us, and we can be friends with him. We're proud, and yet we need to be humble. Please cleanse your hands, O sinners. Purify your hearts, you doubled mind. Instead of sinners, aren't we saints as well? We're both. We have that struggle. It is a battle. So often we are too sold. Instead of our allegiance being solely to God and all the beauties that flow out from it, we kind of waver back and forth, just like James had said earlier in chapter 1. And yet Jesus says no one can serve two masters. Uh, it goes like this. Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one, he'll love the other, he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. A little bit earlier in James, it also said, keep yourself unstained from the world. See, the world will seek to muck us up to make us dirty before God. And the devil will stand in the corner or sometimes in the forefront and say, see, you're not a child of God. You're staying. God doesn't love you anymore. 
And God says, oh, yes, I do. Well, what's this world concept? It's not just the physical world. It's not even the world of people. World means this typically in Scripture. Most of the time, frankly, it says it this way. World is a system of values and priorities that people follow that are contrary to God's word, that are opposed to his person, his rule, his will. We all know John 3, 16, maybe not all, but most. For God so loved the so often we view that, and I've seen commentators say it as well, it's just the world of people, baloney. You look up world and how John uses it, it's the world of people that are shaking their, hip, their fists and saying, I hate you, God. And God saying, oh, but I love you. I love you so much, I'm going to send my son that you might not perish but have everlasting life. It's just not a neutral world. It's a battle. And God enters the battlefield for us. What does the world offer? Let's read this passage. It's in your takeout of sermon notes, 1 John chapter 2. Do not love this world, nor the things the world offers you. For when you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. Friendship with the world means hatred toward God. You have a choice. Again, it's only the Spirit of God that prompts us for the right choice. Our tendency would be pulled toward the world and say, I don't want your values, God. I, I want some other ones. I think I know better than you do. And God says, no, I'm I want to give you the very best. Friendship with God means hatred towards the world's values. They will reject us. We have to know that. When we stand for biblical principles, people will make comments against us. Oh, that biblical stuff, that's outdated. It needs to be modernized. Thus says the Lord, no, sir, no, ma'am. And yet God gives more grace. And he gives that grace so that we might change, be transformed. The word is repentance. We see that in verses 7 through 10. What does it mean? Submit to God at the bottom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. That's the framework. You bow the knee to God, not the, to the world. What does that mean practically? To listen to him, to love others as he has shown love towards us, to remember Jesus in our life, to resist the devil, to come close to God, hear his voice, to follow his ways. Cleanse your hands. That's the external. You'd wash your hands before uh, you go in and be with God. Our externals need to be cleansed, but even more, God is interested in a purified heart. And instead of boasting in, in the world and being happy about sin and evil things, we're to be sorrowful, sad, grieve, mourn, have tears over the evil in the world. What are God's promises? He will lift us up. The devil will flee. God will come close to you. We're to pray like Jesus prayed. Lord, not what I will, but your will be done. James 4.10 is kind of the punchline for me. It's such a great concept. It's such a great truth. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I studied Proverbs in preparation for this message, and over and over again it says, the one who is humble will be exalted. It says it over and over. And yet we think the way of pride is the way of wisdom. Well, at the end of the day, we stand before a holy God. We stand before a Savior who gave his life for us. That's the picture here. Humble ourselves before the Lord. 
What does it mean? I won't do it because I'm too old to get up uh, easily with a hot robe and everything else. But it's to lay down on your face on the ground what you would do before a king. And you don't move until the king tells you to do so. And this king, our Savior Jesus, he comes up to us on the ground and he lifts us up. And we get to see his face. And he's got a smile on it. And you go, oh, I'm so unworthy. And he says, I know you are. But I humbled myself for you on a cross so that I might lift you up and you might see my smile so I could pick you up and you can live for me in the world so you can reach lost people and tell them about my love. But it's not so easy. We go into the world. We want to be first. We're at the table at the banquet with the queen and we head to the front table and she says, no, 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 those are for other people. Or we sit in the back and she says, no, come on up to the front. This whole concept of humility is about the seesaw for me. The teeter-totter. How do you get up on a seesaw? You need somebody else to go down so that you might go up. Jesus went down so we might go up. How do we live humbly before God and others? Lastly, true humility speaks the truth in love. It doesn't slander. It doesn't engage in condemnation of others. Verses 11 and 12, after this, God changes our hands, our heart. We submit to God we say, thank you, God, for forgiving me and lifting me up. And we go out and we see somebody that we don't like and slander, 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 condemn, condemn, condemn. God says, no. You're not following the royal law. You're putting yourself over that law of love. How dare you? I gave myself for you. How dare you play the king, the lawgiver, the judge, when I, the king, stooped for you? So how can we be humble? We confess our sins. We supplicate before God, or we ask him in prayer, Lord, change my heart. We submit to his will for our lives. And then for sure, we don't condemn other people. Because if God doesn't, how dare we do the same? Well, let's pray. Lord, change our heart from a prideful, a heart that's so self-dependent. May we be more dependent upon you. May we turn to you in sadness for the times that we don't see your amazing, humbling love for us. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you that you might lift us up and that we might be exalted someday in heaven. But for here, help us to love you and others. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.